Encryption is easy. Nothing easier than taking every file on your computer and encrypting it. Could give you a tool that did that, no problem. Decryption's the hard part. Being able to guarantee that you can get access to your data when you need it. And that's the reason that very few people use encryption to protect their data at rest today. And that's the reason why we have so many internet security breaches. The data isn't encrypted on the server because using encryption is just too hard. Okay, so the mathematical mesh is a cryptographic infrastructure that aims to make use of encryption easy by making it easy for Alice and her co-workers to get access to data even when it's been encrypted. And so in this presentation, I'm going to show you the use of the mesh to encrypt and decrypt data, uh, show how we can use it to create an end-to-end -end encrypted password vault, contact catalog, and encrypt uh, keys used by applications like SSH, and share those across all the devices Alice's might need to use that data on. Because, you know, we're not in the 1990s anymore where most people would have access to one computer, if any. Uh, today, we, you know, most of us are using uh, dozens of computers. You know, got one on my wrist here. I've got one uh, on my phone. I've, I'm surrounded by uh, half a dozen computer desktop machines. If I'm going to use end-to-end -end encryption to secure my data, I've got to be able to access it on any of the devices uh, that I choose. Uh, so that's what the focus of this presentation is going to be all about. And in the next presentation, I'm going to show how Alice can share her data with Bob. OK, so how do we go about that? Well, uh, the first thing that uh, we, Alice needs to do to use the mesh is to create herself an account. Now, at the moment, all the mesh tools are command line tools. And the reason for this was done was that it's pretty easy to skin a command line tool with a graphical user interface. It's pretty tricky trying to get, trying to automate a graphical user tool. Uh, you know, you could go one way, but not the other. It's kind of like one way encryption. And so pro providing a uh, command line tool, easier for development, easier for testing, and, provi and provide the basis for the GUI tool that is currently in development. Okay, so first let's just show you the version of the software we're using. Same version as before. And first thing I'm going to demonstrate is use that this um, account can talk to this uh, machine. So let's just talk to our mesh service. Okay, so as you can see here, when we executed that command, uh, a uh, transaction was written out to the uh, service log. Okay, so our service is up and it's actually speaking to us. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to uh, create ourselves a mesh account for Alice. Okay, so Alice has created herself an account. And unlike traditional uh, internet accounts, which belong to the service provider who graciously gifted them to their user, this is an account that belongs to Alice. The, I, the core identifier for this account is not actually alice at example.com. It is actually this fingerprint value here. She can, Alice can change her mesh service provider at any time she chooses. Uh, her 
you know, she's not tight and nothing else will change. Bob will still be able to reach her. All her applications will work the same. The only thing that will change is that instead of paying example.com for that mesh service provision, she'll be paying mesh example.net or whoever else. She can even take that service uh, that she's providing for herself and she can move that account to a paid provider or she can take a paid provider account and move it onto her own device. Uh, it's completely fluid. The advantage, so it's an account that belongs to Alice and even though the, uh, the address may change, may change from example.com, Alice's example.com to example.net. This fingerprint will always remain constant. And because of that, that can always be used to uh, present it to a discovery service to find out where Alice is. Okay, so this is Alice's, this fingerprint is now Alice's lifelong identifier. Okay, so we've created a, an account uh, what can we do with it? Well, we can use it for good old PGP style uh, public key encryption. So encrypt uh, foo dot uh, text uh, to foo uh, and Okay, so the uh, file foo.txt, just a simple uh, text file in this case, but it could be any sort of file. It could be a Word document, it could be an image, it could be a movie, it could be an Excel file, it could be SolidWorks, it could be Inventor, it could be any valuable data that Alice would want to use. and. Having encrypted that file, Alice can also decrypt it. So we can encrypt and we can decrypt, same as we could with PGP 30 years ago. So that's not really changed things dramatically, of course, but if we were to build this capability into Word, build it into Excel, build it into SolidWorks and so on, we could, Alice could encrypt or decrypt her files by default without having to think about the fact that she has to encrypt or decrypt. So we're using a line mode here, tool here, but the objective is to get away from the need for Alice to tell the system to encrypt at all. That's something that should be done by the system and not something that Alice should have to ask to be done. Okay, so Alice can now uh, encrypt her file and decrypt it on one of her devices. But, you know, she's got a lot of devices. She does work on her desktop. She also does work on her laptop. And this data isn't going to be any use to her unless she can access it on all the platforms she uses it on. So how do we go about that? Well, what Alice is going to do here is she's going to connect a second uh, device to her personal mesh. So for, first of all, got nothing here. So I've just copied across the uh, encrypted file that we created on her first uh, machine uh, to her second. And this could have been done, I've just copied it across through the file service, but this could have been moved by a USB key, could have been sent in the mail, it doesn't matter. Uh, Alice has a bunch of encrypted uh, bits. Uh, and now, uh, Let's uh, decrypt them on the second machine. And she can't, of course, because although this machine belongs to Alice, 
uh, Alice hasn't uh, told this machine that it's allowed to decrypt on her behalf. So how do we set that up? Well, the mesh provides a uh, four different ways of connecting devices to a personal mesh. Uh, the ones that uh, I would expect people to use in uh, production use uh, involve the use of QR codes. You know, you have a, you print a QR code on a device when it's manufactured, scan it with your phone. You want to correct, connect a device to your uh, mesh. You uh, you you scan a QR code on your administration uh, device. You know that's the way in that's the way that I want to uh, present connection uh, in in production. Uh, for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to use the simplest uh, connection approach, which is also the uh, platform on which the other systems are built, which is uh, comparing witness values. So on the device I want to connect, Okay, so on the device I want to connect, I've sent a request. And then on uh, the administ the first device uh, that Alice connect on which she created the mesh, her personal mesh, uh, and Alice is going to review her uh, pending connection requests. Okay, we've got one connection request, and now she's going to accept. And notice here when the first when the device that uh, it was trying to connect uh, sent out the request, it, it presents this witness value. Uh, obviously, this would preferably be presented in a, a more flexible, you know, more impactful GUI sort of way. Uh, presents up a witness value showing uh, CMY CYMX uh, ENTB, uh, and here the connection request has the same uh, witness value. And so we specify that when we accept the request. Oh, we have to, and it refuses to allow us to connect because we're not saying what we're going to allow this connecting device to do. As I said in the previous demo, the mesh is all about least privilege. I do not want my coffee pot being able to read my email and really don't want to be able to send email. Same for the fridge. Uh, this is Alice's laptop. She, she wants to po populate that laptop with a fairly wide set of privileges. Uh, and we have a rights identifier for that that is called web, uh, that's been pre-configured. And so Alice has accepted the device. And now all Alice needs to do is to complete the connection request on the second device. And now she is fully connected. And now she can decrypt that file. So we can now encrypt data documents on this device and they can be read on this device, which is a, a fairly powerful result. Uh, encrypting the, and uh, we can encrypt any sort of document image, whatever, and the impact is really uh, quite minor. You can see here the original file was 29 bytes. Uh, the encrypted file was 617 bytes. So it's increased by about 600 bytes. That is a fixed penalty, not a percentage inflation. Uh, if we had a gigabyte uh, of data that we encrypted, uh, the encrypted version will be a gigabyte and 600 bytes. So it's fast, it's convenient. Um, in order to take the uh, demonstration to the next level, however, uh, I'm going to connect a third device. And this time I'm going to connect it with a different set of writes. This time, I'm going to start the connection request on the administration device.
Okay, so I've created, created myself a pin number here, ABHT. Okay, and so imagine that Alice is uh, sitting at home and uh, somebody is um, in the beach cottage trying to connect a, their laptop to Alice's personal uh, mesh uh, for Alice because they're configuring it for her. Uh, Alice could phone them up and give her this them this pin number over uh, over that phone line. Or alternatively, uh, when we go to the QR connection um, mechanisms, that pin number can be encoded in the pin uh, that's presented on the administration device and picked up on the connecting device. So what Alice is going to do now is she is going to uh, go to the phone that she's connecting and she's going to enter that pin. And as I said, this is something that preferably will be automatically connected, collected um, via QR code. Uh, now, so she set, she sent off the re request. Uh, she can't decode uh, devices, any documents yet. Uh, let's just get it. So she's got that. Uh, she's she sent her request out, but it's not been approved yet. Um, so that she's not fully connected. Uh, all Alice needs to do to approve that. Um, request though, is to simply synchronize her account. And the reason for that is that she has pre-approved uh, a request presented with that PIN number uh, when she created the PIN. And now we're going to, so now on the phone, she completes her connection. Okay, so now we can encrypt and decrypt exactly like before. Well, not quite. You see, there is one small difference. When we decrypted, uh, when we decrypt on this um, machine, nothing happens on the server. This machine, the first device, the laptop, does not need to talk to the service to decrypt data. When I decrypt on the second device, the device I, cr I connected with the threshold write, each time I decrypt, the service performs an operation. And that is because we didn't provision out the decryption de key to the second device. We only provisioned out a threshold key share to the device and gave the other half of that th threshold key share to the service. And what that means is that this device cannot decrypt on its own unless the service performs that other half of the decryption operation for the device. Contrawise, because the service only has a threshold key share and not the threshold key, the service cannot decrypt at all. Okay, so at this point we've created a mesh account and we created two additional devices. What can we do with that account for Alice? Well, one thing that Alice might want to do is just use the mesh to store her web bookmarks. Um, and so the mesh creates a bookmark catalog when it's created. So we're going to create, so I'm going to add a bookmark on uh, her first account, her, her first device. And now she can synchronize her account on the second device. So she can update, she can add bookmarks on any of her uh, machines and synchronize through her mesh service and read them on any of the machines. Okay, so we've now got the ability to synchronize our bookmarks between browsers. That's a feature that we've only had now for 25 years. 
but there's one very important difference. This bookmark catalog is end-to-end -end encrypted. The mesh service provider doesn't see the bookmarks Alice added. All it sees is the encrypted um, objects that are added to the append only log. And the second thing that's different is that this is an open standard for synchronizing bookmarks between browsers. So one day, someday in the future, you might be able to store a bookmark on Microsoft Edge and then be able to use read that bookmark on Google Chrome or Safari or Firefox or anything else that will provide a plugin that allows you to view open source end-to-end -end encrypted bookmarks. Okay, so that's one type of data that we can share between uh, devices, um, but isn't end-to-end -end encryption uh, a bit over the top? Well, I don't think so. Not for bookmarks, uh, and especially not for the next thing, which is passwords. Imagine if every browser you had could access a common, non-proprietary password vault that was end-to-end -end encrypted under a secure public key system so that you could use those passwords on any of your browsers without having to type in anything. Not depending upon, not one password, not last password, no passwords. Get away from in password insecurity completely. Well, the mesh allows us to do just that. So uh, let's add a uh, password to our password catalog. And now let's just take a look at our passwords. Okay, and now we can synchronize. So again, the data is end-to-end -end encrypted. The service provider can't see any of it. And this is really important for the service provider because if there were to be a breach in which Alice is saying, oh, somebody stole my password and they've taken all my apes. I am, I've lost the three quarters of a million dollars I spent on my NET apes because somebody stole my password. You know, that could be a nasty lawsuit for the password service provider. But if they're end-to-end -end encrypted, the service provider can say, well, I never had that data. I couldn't have breached your data because I never had access to it. The only way that a breach of my service could result in a compromise of your data is if somebody's broken AES 256. So it's not always just about protecting the user. It's also about protecting the service. OK, so we've configured two catalogs and the mesh provides uh, us with uh, a series of catalogs. There's a contacts catalog, which I'll describe in the next podcast when Alice interacts with Bob. There is a network settings catalog. Uh, there is an applications catalog and I'll show you the applications catalog now because that is sh that shows us how we can use the mesh to secure legacy applications that use crypto. If you if you're a system administrator or a developer, you're probably very familiar with SSH. Um, Alice can create herself a SSH application. OK, so what's happened here is that Alice created an SSH client key pair and provisioned the private key for that key pair to her devices that she has granted the web uh, set of rights. So that means that she can now uh, obtain the private key uh, 
on the devices uh, that uh, she gave that web right to. Oh, we have to. We do have to synchronize. But the third device, the device that we only connected with the threshold uh, privilege, uh, that doesn't get the SSH client key. And you know, why would you want your SSH client key on your phone? I mean, yes, I might be tapping away at a server from my iPhone, but I rather think I'd try and avoid that at all costs. So again, least privilege. These two devices have the ability to get the SSH pri private key. Let's just take a look at one of them. And we could then use, uh, we can then write ourselves a script that would take that private key and provision it into OpenSSH or PuTTY or whatever other tool I was using for SSH on uh, that particular platform. This device, the threshold connected device, uh, doesn't get to uh, read the private key, but it can read the public key. The threshold device can't get the private key, but it can get the public key. So I could uh, connect, configure the SSH server on my phone so that I would allow it to accept an SSH uh, login. Okay, so this particular presentation is suboptimal in that what you would probably want to do instead is to write a shell script that would populate the keys to PuTTY, to OpenSSH or whatever as the platform requires. But uh, at this point, it's early days uh, and so the core functionality, the mesh is only doing the core functionality. Okay, so what we've done so far is we've shown Alice using the mesh to uh, put quite a bit of her sensitive data onto her devices. And so this now brings us to the question of what happens if Alice loses her device? And there are actually two variations of this question. One is what happens if Alice loses just one device, her phone. She is, uh, she's had her phone stolen. She uh, was trying to flee uh, Ukraine and she was stopped by a border guard who stole her phone. How does she stop that? Her, how does she stop her valuable personal data being taken? Well, that's one important question. The second important question is, what happened if Alice has flown Ukraine and all her devices have been lost? So she makes it out to the other side. Her data is all there stored on Google Drive or OneDrive or iCloud or whatever. All her data has been saved, but it's encrypted. How does she get access back to it? We've got to solve that problem as well. Okay, so first things first. How does Alice stop the loss of her phone resulting in the compromise of her data? Well, the answer is when Alice connected the phone, she connected it with the threshold privilege, which means that this device, her third device, does not have the ability to decrypt by itself, it doesn't have the full decryption key. It only has a key share. And so if we now delete that device from Alice's account, uh, it won't be able to decrypt any information. So let's just uh, do that. The, the third device first. Oh, helps to uh, 
Okay, so we're now going to try and do the decode operation. And notice I'm not going to do an account sync. I'm not going to do anything. Can't do it. And that's because the key share has been deleted off the mesh service. So that mesh service is not going to allow this device to do any more decryptions. OK, so at this point, we've stopped Alice's device being used to decrypt any of Alice's sensitive information. But if we look at the directory, but if we look at the directory, all any data that she's already decrypted is still there. OK, so we've mitigated further compromise, but we haven't um, haven't stopped compromise of unencrypted data that happened to be stored on that device. And this is always a compromise between how much use do you want to allow the device to have when it's in an offline mode versus what degree of control do you want to have over the data? And there's no perfect answer. Okay, so now let's just okay, so now let's just go back to our first device and delete that. And as you can see, um, our ability to decrypt documents isn't affected at all. In the next release of the MeshMan tool, uh, the tool will automatically uh, synchronize up to the service find out that it has been deleted and refuse to perform uh, further decryptions. But that's actually a much weaker form of control than the threshold capability provides, uh, which is also, incidentally, why this particular incarnation of the tool doesn't automatically synchronize so I can show these effects. So I can try and make the mesh, I can try and make this device uh, delete its keys, but that's not something I can absolutely guarantee. The threshold connected device, I can delete that from Alice's personal mesh and it will stay deleted. Okay, so we've now, we're now down to one device again. And we've got that second question. What happens if Alice has lost all of her devices? All her data has, has survived, but it's encrypted. How does she get access to it? And this is where the mesh provides for account recovery. So Alice can uh, tell it to escrow her primary secret, the secret from which all her signature and escrow encryption keys are derived. And that's a a uh, very strong 512-bit uh, secret uh, that is, um, sorry, and this is a strong 256-bit secret. Uh, and here we see, see that it has been split into three shares, two of which uh, are required to reconstruct the original key. And she could create a, almost any number. She can create up to 16 shares. She can require a quorum, a threshold of two or three or four or five even to reconstruct. So Alice can take her primary key, split it up into three shares and send those shares uh, to where she is trying to go via independent means carry one, only one on herself uh, so that she knows that if she makes it to the uh, outside world uh, and survives, then her data will survive with her, provided that she can contact one of those uh, other uh, key shareholders uh, she gave that data to. Okay, so in this presentation, I've been demonstrating the use of the mesh by Alice for Alice. I've shown how she can use it to end-to-end -to -end encrypt documents, bookmarks, 
passwords, and also how she can use threshold encryption to control the ability of certain devices that might get lost to decrypt, and how in the case of a complete catastrophe, Alice can recover her complete uh, mesh account, knowing only her account address and the key shares, her key recovery shares. Thank you for watching and please stay for the third part of this demonstration where Alice is finally going to meet Bob. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for giving me your time. Please like, please subscribe, and please consider giving some of your time to the Mathematical Mesh Project. We don't just need developers, we need people to try out the code and see if it meets real people's needs. Over the past 20 years, internet security has mostly got worse rather than better. It reminds me of the Lorax at the end where all the trees have been cut down and the what was once a paradise has been turned into a barren landscape and the old Wansler says that things aren't going to improve unless somebody cares a lot. And a few years ago I realised that maybe I had to be that person, maybe I was the one who had to care. And I've spent the past three years, mostly working alone, developing this code. It's not going to take effect without a movement, without other people deciding that they care a lot and that they want to help change the web, change the internet for the better. The mesh might not be the final answer, to internet insecurity, but I do think, at the very least, it is a proof of concept that we can do much better than we're doing today. Thank you for watching.